A prominent Catholic education group and several Catholic colleges and universities are blasting the U.S. Supreme Court's decision late last week to overturn affirmative action in higher education. The Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities called the decision, quote, more than disappointing, adding that it, quote, ignores the more than apparent effects of continued racism in our society. The Catholic University of America and Georgetown University also spoke out against the ruling. The University of Notre Dame released a more measured response, saying that it will study the ruling before moving forward. Well, we now go to Christopher Bedford, executive editor of the upcoming journal at the Common Sense Society. Chris, welcome back as always. And we have a lot to discuss, but first I want to get your take on the Catholic school's reaction to the Supreme Court's affirmative action ruling. What do you think about this? Well, I don't think it's very surprising to see that from many of these schools. Uh, these are generally speaking elite universities. A number of them, including Georgetown, have traded in a lot of their actual Catholic bona fides in exchange for that kind of respect. And these institutes are seriously captured by groups that really do, the activist groups that really do think that the only way to address inequality or problems in our society and humanity is to have different kinds of racial quotas and things like that. Now, if I were them, I actually wouldn't be too worried about this because, well, the affirmative action case is has, has, has been struck down, colleges are still able to have a holistic view of what they're going to let in. And I see a lot of these universities going around this ruling and still making decisions based on race or gender or politics and just calling that approach holistic. We've already seen places outside of maybe MIT getting rid of SAT scores, getting rid of uh, different kinds of testing and other sta more standardized measures and relying on this. And well, I expect that to continue. Well, let's talk about the other issue. The nation's highest court on Friday also ruled against the Biden administration and its plan for student debt forgiveness. Help us unpack this. How does this uh, possibly hurt the president politically? Well, the president suffered in the first round for his first election, especially during the primaries, and has since in getting enthusiasm from some of the younger, more left-wing voters and, and, and youth voters Democrats have been able to rely on in recent years. He doesn't speak to a lot of the same issues that they really care about, but student loans is a way to get them energized. They did this in time for the midterms, and it was a fully calculated political decision. The president said openly that he knew he couldn't really push for more, and he already was probably exceeding his authority with doing this. The Supreme Court said that they he, he did indeed do that. So now it's up to them to try and figure out a, a more constitutional way to try and do this. One of the different methods that they're trying to work on and test out right now is making it income tested. So maybe if you make less than $33,000 a year, for example, you have to pay $0 in student loans until you start to make more. That sort of thing might be more palatable to the Supreme Court and then would end up helping them again with these young voters. Switching gears now, we've heard from former President Trump praising the high court's decision this weekend. He held a rally out there in South Carolina that drew a massive crowd. Are there any other Republican candidates gr gaining traction in this race, uh, the Republican nomination race? No, not that we've seen so far. There's places, there's folks that have gained traction with the donors, for example, uh, Ron DeSantis, for example, right. and he's got a lot of people in D.C. who are paying attention to him. But the only person from either political party who's able to gather these sorts of festival-like crowds is still absolutely Donald Trump. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean anything yet. It's still early. Donald Trump has a six-year running advantage on any other GOP candidate, and the debates haven't begun. That's when people really start to pay attention. A lot of those voters out there haven't seen a Donald Trump speech maybe in the last year or two or three years, haven't really kept up with this, but so they still support him. And maybe that'll change. We'll give it an in for different candidates like Ron DeSantis and others uh, after these debates begin. And Chris, talk to us about some of the other stories that you're working on right now. Yeah, you know, one thing that caught my eye as we entered this Independence Day was a piece in the New York Times about how so many you know, more Americans are just not feeling patriotic, but not willing to celebrate. It started out with an 18-year-old girl being interviewed who said she used to love it as a child, but now she thinks it sounds like gunshots, and she thinks mm -hmm. America is a racist country, and also there's so many pollutants and fireworks. And it just strikes me as such a, a joyless and kind of neurotic way to view the world. And people should, the, this country has come a long way. There's a lot of things that still need to be worked on. There's a lot of things that people have worked on, given their lives toward and for over the decades to bring us that. So this July 4th, we're not celebrating the perfect country. We're not in heaven yet. We're celebrating a country that tries to do better every single day, every single year, and the sacrifices that those have made before to get us this far. 
Amen to that. We are a relatively very young country out there. And uh, Christopher Bedford, executive editor of the upcoming journal at the Common Sense Society, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.